Okay, so talking about head trauma, what are the topics we want to discuss? Of course, we want to talk about all the different types of hemorrhages that can occur in the brain, and we'll start externally and work our way in. Epidural hematoma, we'll talk about subdural hematoma, as well as subdural hygroma, which is very different than subdural hematoma. Even though people use these words interchangeably, they do it incorrectly. The, uh, and then subarachnoid hemorrhage. Uh, could you do control A, please, for the, for the mouse, the control A? Thank you. Um, and then the intraparenchymal neoplasm, cerebral contusion, and DAI. Okay, and again, people use these words interchangeably, and actually they're very different entities, and we'll talk about why. And then subsequently, the results of these hemorrhages that can result in diffuse cerebral edema and herniation of the brain. And then finally, if we have time, we'll finish off with vascular injury and fractures. Okay, so very quickly, let's go through this in 10, 15 minutes. Epidural hematoma. Classic appearance here, they're biconcave, they're extraaxial um, lesions, so they're outside the brain but inside the calvarium, and they tend to have this bilenticular configuration. Now that's a pretty good clue to tell you that this is epidural hematoma, but I'll tell you better ways to know that this is epidural hematoma. Now these usually occur in young adults and they're usually associated with skull fractures. Okay, so what's better clues to know? First of all, the best thing is that they're confined by the skull sutures. They cannot go outside the sutures of the um, calvarium. And that's because if we take this picture for a moment and think about the anatomy, it makes sense. So here's the dura. There are two parts to the dura. There's an external layer and an internal layer. The external layer is the periosteum of the inner table of the bone. The inner layer is what creates the falks and the tentorium, the dural reflections. Adjacent to that, we have the arachnoid. And so the space between that dura and the arachnoid, that's going to be the subdural space. We'll get back to that. And then, of course, the arachnoid has these little web-like projections that come along the surface of the brain, which has the pia along the surface of the brain. And so between that arachnoid and the pia is going to be the subarachnoid space. So now, if I get a calvarial fracture, that can rupture things like the middle meningeal artery, and that blood is going to collect between the bone and its periosteum, which is that outer layer of dura, and it's going to tear the periosteum off the bone and collect between the bone and the periosteum. But it can only tear as far as the edges of the periosteum, which is the sutures of that bone. It can't go outside the sutures. And so that's why this is a really good way to differentiate these two. As a matter of fact, if I go back and I look at this image again, this is the coronal suture, and this is the lambdoid suture, and that's where this stops, okay? And that's why this is a better way to think about epidural hematoma, and we'll get back to why that is in a second. Here's a skull fracture. Here's that door being pulled away from the bone. Okay, same thing here. Skull fracture, epidural mass, stopping right at the coronal suture. And here's one in the posterior fossa on MRI. Of course, the blood imaging characteristics here, I can be more precise, not just saying, well, it's probably a week old or two weeks old or three weeks old, being acute, subacute, chronic, which we do on CT. You know, here I have um, deoxyhemoglobin, ISO on T1, dark on T2, as well as intracellular methemoglobin, bright on T1 and dark on T2. So I have a pretty good idea that this occurred about three, four days ago, you know, with the mixture of those two um, blood um, characteristics. I'm not going to go over all the differences of blood on MR, but you should, of course, be aware of that. Okay, subdural hematoma. Um, uh, these actually have a pretty high mortality rate as well. They're really bad. Really, you know, epidural is bad, but subdural is bad too. Now, these usually occur in inf infants and elderly because this is due to rupture of the bridging cortical veins. As the head rotates or moves around, those veins are stretched and they subsequently rupture. Now, the reason they're more common in infants and elderly is that the brain isn't up against the skull when you're an infant. You know, the brain hasn't grown out yet, and when you're elderly and you have atrophy, it shrinks away from the skull. So as you get that rotational force, since there's some difference between the brain and the skull, you can get pulling or more easy pulling of those brain, uh, brain veins, and you can rupture those veins. Okay, typical imaging characteristics here of uh, subdural hematomas, even though this one looks a little bit lentiform in configuration, this is subdural, it is going outside the skull sutures, right? So this is a subdural hematoma, the typical crescentic appearance more common for a subdural hematoma, but outside the skull sutures. Okay, 
Um, but they are, however, confined by the Falx and the uh, Tentorium because, again, they're in this compartment between the Dura and the Arachnoid, so they have to stay inside the Falx. They can't cross over to the other side. If you have subdurals on both sides, that's because you ruptured veins on both sides, not because one side sent, was uh, spread over to the other. So again, nice big case of subdurals here. Here goes a really large one. Again, kind of looks lenticular, but goes beyond the skull sutures, the better clue. This is subdural in location. You could also see some of the blood traveling along the um, dural reflections there, the fox. Okay, this is a patient who came in, had a big butcher knife sticking out of his head, put him in the CT scanner, had this subdural hematoma, and again, you could see it confined by the fox as well. When they're sort of in the subacute scathe, they're what we call isodense subdurals. They're similar to the density of the cortex here, so they're hard to see. Of course, this cortex is way too inwardly displaced, telling you there's something there. But if I do MR in the subacute stage, which is met hemoglobin, they're going to be, uh, sorry, uh, if I do uh, subdural windows here on the CT, it may make it a little bit easier to see that hemorrhage. But if I do MR, since it's met hemoglobin at this point, which is bright on T1, they're much, much easier to see on MR than on CT. To me, you know, that's pretty tough to see, uh, even though that's a pretty large uh, hematoma there. Okay, subdural hygroma, which I said is very different than hematoma. This is from a tear in the arachnoid. This is where CSF goes from the subarachnoid space into the subdural space. This is not a hemorrhage. People call chronic subdural hematomas subdural hygromas, and that's completely wrong. Subdural hygromas can be acute, they can continue to grow, they can cause mass effect on the brain, they can cause herniation. So just because they're low density on CT, you know, when people say, oh, it's that chronic subdural hematoma, hygroma thing, don't worry about it, it's been there for a month, that's absolutely incorrect. It's from a tear in the arachnoid, and it's a collection of CSF, not blood, not chronic blood. And so when I see this, I have to tell the clinician to be careful. Yes, it may be a chronic subdural hematoma, but it also may be an acute subdural hygroma that will continue to grow potentially and cause problems. Okay, subarachnoid hemorrhage, of course, we always think of this in the context of ruptured aneurysms, but truthfully, the number one cause of subarachnoid hemorrhage is trauma. And the blood vessels that live in that subarachnoid space, if those blood vessels rupture, of course, you're going to get blood in that subarachnoid space. And so you're going to see it everywhere you see CSF. And so surrounding the brainstem in the sulci, I see all this high density. Here's a pathologic specimen. That's all subarachnoid blood. Here I can see it in cilium pictures. There's also intraventricular blood here. This can lead to hydrocephalus, in particular from intraventricular blood blocking the foramen of Monroe in this case, or from obstruction of the pachyonian granulations over the cerebral convexities, you can get a communicating hydrocephalus as well from subarachnoid blood. Here's a little bit in the interpeduncular cistern. Here's some subarachnoid blood in the sylvian fissure. And flare imaging is wonderful for finding subarachnoid hemorrhage. T1 and T2, not too good, because it's iso, in iso intense to the CSF. But on flare, the blood stays bright. The CSF goes dark. Very, very easy to see all of the subarachnoid hemorrhage. OK, intraparenchymal hemorrhages, of course, every big category of disease can cause an intraparenchymal hemorrhage. However, um, we're going to talk about two of them in the trauma setting, which is DAI, shear injury, and cerebral contusion. Of course, an intraparenchymal hemorrhage will be surrounded by parenchyma. So no big surprise in terms of the imaging characteristics, but let's go over these two entities. Cerebral contusion, which are basically brain bruises. They're little contusions on the surface of the brain. This is where the brain smacks against the calvarium, and you get hemorrhages on the surface of the brain. So here you can see the high-density high foci of hemorrhage on the surface of the brain. And over time, they'll grow. So you are going to find them in this state when they come into the ER. This is for two days and four days later. So you have to be very careful, look very carefully along the surface of the brain and find these little tiny hemorrhages. You would hate to call this normal, send the patient out, and four days later have this happen. OK, you can see them on MR2. You know, here they go on the surface of the brain. Now, how are they different from shear injury? Shear injury is deep within the brain. It's a pulling or shearing between the gray-white junction of the brain cells. And so um, you're going to see these things deep within the brain, along the subcortical, gray-white junctions. Uh, they also occur within the corpus callosum. 
surrounding the um, basal ganglia and the adjacent white matter tracts, as we see here. Okay, and it's important to differentiate these from contusions because usually these patients don't do well at all. They usually do very bad when, when you have shear injury, diffuse axonal injury. Unlike the patients with cortical contusions, they could actually do pretty good. You know, so it's important prognostic information. On MRI, of course, I see the low signal intensity here on gradient imaging from the hemorrhage. The majority of them, however, are only edematous, and so MRI is better for shear injury than CT because it's hard to see the edematous lesions on CT. Here, of course, I see a nice big lesion within the corpus callosum. Okay, all these things can lead to diffuse cerebral edema, diffuse swelling of the brain. This is sometimes hard to pick up because it's diffuse, it's uniform through the brain. The best clue that I like is looking at the cisternal spaces. Young or old, doesn't matter, should always have uh, uh, patent cisternal spaces around the brainstem. When you lose those cisternal spaces, you have to worry about diffuse cerebral edema. Young people, of course, may not have big sulci, as we have in the elderly population, but you should always have your CSF spaces. Okay, different types of herniations, supertentorial herniations. You can get, of course, subfalcine herniation. You could get uncle herniation. If the mass is in the posterior fossa, of course, the big herniation that you worry about is through the frame of magnum, tonsillar herniation. Here we can see some herniation under the dura. Uh, here, midline herniation. Here's that uncle herniation. You could see this resulted in hemorrhage of the brainstem. Of course, killed the patient and gave us this pathologic specimen. Uh, moving on to dissection, vascular injury. This can be either from direct or indirect trauma. Um, ICA dissects right near the carotid bifurcation in the mid-neck region. The vertebral artery tends to dissect at the cranial junction, cranial vertebral junction, because that's where that vertebral artery is tethered by the dura as it penetrates through the dura. So that's where it tends to get pulled and dissected. So if I'm looking at angiography, you know, Vessels should always taper from big to small, nice and gradual. So here I see the lumen of the vessel being opacified. It's small, it's big, it's small, it's big. You know, a lot of irregularity there, a lot of narrowing telling me there's dissection. But I think MRI is even better than angiography because here I can visualize the hematoma within the vessel wall. And here, you know, you can see the normal flow void of the ICA here. Here the flow void, yes, it's getting narrowed, but more importantly, I can actually see the hematoma itself within the vessel wall. And so this is the best way, in my opinion, to find dissections. You can see them on CT as well. You know, you can see the nice big dissection flap here, but truthfully in the carotid and vertebral basilar systems, you usually don't see the flap. You may see some narrowing of the vessel, but that's gonna be the only thing you're gonna see. Um, unlike the, the great vessels here, you know, in the aortic arch, you'll see the flap. Usually in the, in the carotid arteries, internal carotid arteries in the veins, you do not see the flap. Okay, last thing, skull fractures and facial fractures. So, you know, fractures get named just like they get named everywhere else in the body. The important thing to think about, in particular for skull fractures, are the associated complications that occur from the fracture. You know, you can get infections, you can get CSF leak, you can get enlarging pneumocephalus, and in babies, leptomeningeal cysts. So here's a common nudo fracture. Here's a depressed fracture, which of course is the more important one because that could tear the dura. You could get CSF leaks, you can get infection. And in ch children, if the fracture is large enough, you may not get reunion of the edges of the calvarium and you can remain with a hole in the calvarium that we call this leptomeningeal cyst. Okay, facial fractures. So facial fractures involve a lot of very small bones in the face, so they can be difficult to detect. So you want to try to identify clues to draw your eye to those areas of small fractured bones. So look for the overlying soft tissue swelling, look for blood and fluid in the sinuses, air in the surrounding soft tissues. We like to break them up into these nice separate categories, but the truth is they're usually a combination of categories, and we'll very quickly run through these. So nasal bone fractures here, no surprise there. This is that zygomatico-maxillary complex fracture, otherwise easily called a tripod fracture. I like to remember this by just thinking about my high cheekbone. If you think of your high cheekbone and kind of draw a circle around it, you'll remember all the bones that get busted in a tripod fracture. It's your inferior orbit, it's your anterior maxillary sinus, 
posterior lateral maxillary sinus and zygoma, which goes over the side of your face, of course. Can also involve the lateral orbit too, but not always, just may. But if you think about that, your high cheekbone, just think of the bones there, you'll remember all these bones. And here we go, anterior maxillary sinus, posterior lateral maxillary sinus, lateral orbit, inferior orbit, and zygoma. You can see very nicely that high cheekbone displaced on the shaded surface display CT. Okay, finally, the Lafort fractures. So there's Lafort one, two, and three. All the Lafort fractures involve the pterygoid plates. Lafort one is through the maxilla, straight across. Okay, so you're going to get your anterior, medial, and posterior lateral walls of the maxillary sinus, as well as those pterygoid plates. Lafort two is a pyramidal fracture, so it's going to go through the nose, the medial and inferior orbits, and then through the maxilla, and of course through the pterygoid plates. And so you get this sort of pyramid-type fracture, as we can see on the shaded surface display. And finally, the last thing, Lafort three, which is complete craniofacial separation. Here we can see through the nasal bones, the medial and lateral orbits, and then down through the zygomas and the pterygoid plates. And you can see those fractures here. Um, nasal bones, medial orbit, lateral orbit, and here's a nice coronal view showing the fractures through the pterygoid plates. Okay, that's everything I have for you. Hope it was information um, and um, some little tidbits you could take back to your practices. Thank you for your attention.